those who've been affected um, by those incidents of violence. Um, I just pray for peace in, in our country and in the world. Um, continue to pray for those affected by COVID. I know particularly India um, is having a really bad outbreak right now. Um, so just a lot of continued prayers um, for that. And within this community of Kipling, we also have some prayer requests to lift up. Lift up. Dwight Cotton um, is, will be having heart bypass surgery on Thursday the 22nd, that's this Thursday, at Duke Medical in Durham. Um, so we want to pray for him. He had arteries that were blocked and stints weren't an option, so he has to have surgery. Um, and so we pray for him. We lift him and his family up and hold them in the light of Christ. Oh, he goes on Tuesday. Because okay. he has to go in early later, and then the surgery is Thursday. If the surgery is Thursday. Yes. So prayers for him throughout this entire week as he goes into the hospital and then has the surgery on Thursday. Um, we also want to lift up uh, the family of Kathy Bradley. Her funeral is being held here um, this afternoon. That's primarily for family members today. Um, no. Kathy Bradley, um, her family, and her, her funeral here today. Thank you for that. And it will be live streamed on the Kipling Church site. I'll be here to live stream it for anybody who um, can't make it but can watch it live streamed on the Kipling United Methodist Church Facebook page. Perfect. Okay, so um, in case it wasn't clear on the camera, but uh, Jennifer said that the service will be live streamed for anybody who wants to participate virtually as well. 2 p.m., I think, right? I thought it was 3. 3 p.m.? 3 p.m. 3 p.m. The family of um, Howard Matthews, that's Becky Parrish's nephew, um, he passed away this week, and so um, we lift them up and we hold them in the light of Christ as they are grieving um, his loss. And Joe Croft, who's a friend and neighbor of Donna and Joe Alexander, he has bladder cancer, and he will start a different chemo treatment on Monday, and so we want to um, continue to pray for him and lift him up and pray that this treatment will work and be effective. And also for Mike Jackson, I so miss being able to see Jill sitting right there in the front row, um, but I know that she is with her brother and still caring for her brother as he is in hospice care. So we continue to lift him up and lift their whole family up um, as they go through these difficult days. Um, together. And now of God's ever-loving care for us and mindful of um, everything that has happened in the country and in the world this week, um, will you go to God with me in prayer? God of love, we come to you this morning with heavy hearts, bearing the weight of all that has happened in our world this week. It feels like every morning when we wake up, there is more breaking news, headlines flashing on our screens, alerting us to another tragedy. More injustice, more violence, more death, more pain. Earlier this week, we learned of the deaths of Dante Wright and Adam Toledo in encounters with the police. And on Thursday, we woke up to the news of another mass shooting. God. Our hearts are broken over the loss of life in all these situations. Our hearts break with yours, Lord, over the deaths of your beloved children made in your image. This morning we pray especially for the communities in Minnesota and Illinois that were affected by violence this week. We pray for our black and brown brothers and sisters who are crying out again for justice. We all those who are facing the trauma of witnessing a mass shooting. We pray for families and friends who are grieving the loss of loved ones due to violence. And we pray for police officers everywhere who are in filled situations every day and are called to be first responders in moments of crisis. We pray for the healing, safety, and protection of all these people, God. For all of them are your beloved children, made in your image. 
God, in the face of so much chaos and confusion, sometimes we feel helpless. Sometimes we feel numb. We don't understand why these things keep happening again and again. And yet we remember that you sent your son into the world to transform it with love and to defeat death itself. And we proclaim that Christ is risen, is seated on the throne, and is reigning over all. So this morning we boldly ask that you would come. In all those places where there is injustice, would you bring justice? In all those places where there is violence, would you bring peace? In all those places where there is hatred, would you sow love? In all those places where there is death, would you bring life? Bring us to life, Lord. Bring this community of Kipling United Methodist Church to life. Call us into resurrection life. Make us instruments of your justice, peace, love, and life in a world that is broken and held captive by the power of sin. We know that you can, God. We believe that you will. Break the power of sin by the power of your love in the power of Jesus' name. It is in that power that we pray the prayer that is us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now I invite Miss Vicki out to do our children's moment this morning. Is it not here? I'll be fine. Wow. Where'd everybody go today? They stayed home. They stayed home. <laughs> they did. They did. Well, well six of them aren't here. That's true. That's true. That's the crowd. That's the crowd. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus rode the donkeys before he died, do you know what city he rode the donkeys into? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's right. Well, there were two little donkeys walking side by side one day. And they were walking down the road, talking back and forth. And one little donkey was saying, man, did you see that crowd of people the other day? I've never seen so many people in Jerusalem before. The other little donkey says, yes, and they were laying their clothes and their coats down on the road for me to walk on. But now, nobody recognizes me anymore. Do you know why? Why? Because that was the little donkey that carried Jesus into Jerusalem. And the people would lay their clothes down on the road because they were saying, Hail King, Hail the King. Because they knew Jesus was the King they were looking for. And when, when that little donkey didn't have Jesus anymore on his back, and he didn't have any more clothes on the road, nobody recognized him. God tells us that we have to keep Jesus' love in our hearts. And every day... We keep our smiles on our faces so that people can see God's love in our hearts. It's like putting on the cloak of Jesus, putting on his coat so that when we wear Jesus' cover, people see him, right? So you remember that little donkey and how he had clothes. He had Jesus and he had clothes on him. But the next day, nobody did. You keep Jesus' love in your heart every single day, and you help your friends, and you help your mom and dad, and you show Jesus by how you think, how you act, and how you pray. Okay? Every day. All right, let's say our prayer. Dear Lord.
Lord, these children are so precious to you and to me. Lord, thank you for those little donkeys that taught us the lesson. Thank you for that donkey that remembered nobody looked at him. Nobody recognized him because he didn't have Jesus. But that's the way it is, Lord. If we don't have you in our hearts, then what are we? We're no good. We have in our hearts, Lord, and we have to know that Jesus is the one we live for every day so that people see him through us in what we do, what we say, how we act. Let us remember. God, as we go through this week, let us always do what you would have us to do. Let us always emulate you, Lord. Let us always be like you. Take us, keep us safe, and bring us back next Sunday, ready to talk to you again. Amen. <laughs>
really spoke to me, and so I changed the song for this morning, and I hope that it blesses you um, with a word of hope.
people would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh God, the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Speak a word to us this morning, Lord. It's in your name we pray. So I'm going to be real honest with y'all this morning about one of my biggest flaws. It's this. I get defensive real fast when I feel like somebody is calling me out or blaming me for something. Anybody else in here? Can, can, can we, okay. Yeah, thank you. I got one. <laughs> my mother would tell you that I've struggled with this since I was a child. Always been stubborn, always been defensive. Just my whole life. And even though I'd like to think that I've made some improvement over the years, my husband, Mike, would tell you, and I know this, that it still gets the best of me sometimes. It's like, if I feel like somebody is coming at me, I start getting ready with all my best explanations for why I did what I did, why my actions were justified, why I'm right. Another way to put it is that I'm not very good at taking criticism. It's a weakness of mine. And it's not the kind of weakness that you talk about in a job interview because it's actually going to be perceived as a strength, like, I'm a perfectionist, or I'm a workaholic. No, no. This is the kind of weakness that interviewers really don't want to hear because it's important. 
to be able to be receptive to constructive criticism, that's how you improve. That's how you get better. But this morning, I just want to lay all my cards on the table and be real with y'all that I have not come Maybe that's why when I read this passage, when I hear what Peter says to the Israelites, I find myself really sympathizing with them. Because, I mean, Peter is calling them out. He does not go easy on them. He lays into them. You handed Jesus over and rejected him. You asked to have a murderer released instead of Jesus. You killed Jesus, the author of life. Ouch. I sympathize with the Israelites in this passage because I know how uncomfortable it is to be called out. And I can only imagine what it must have felt like in that moment to be called for killing Jesus. Can you imagine to be held responsible for Jesus' death? The Apostle Peter, speaking to the Israelites in this passage, was one of Jesus' disciples. He was himself an Israelite, a Jew, but one who had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, who God had raised from the dead. As Baptist minister Willie Jennings says, this is an in-house conversation. It's like between the people of Kipling UMC, like it's, it's in-house, right? Peter is speaking to his people here, his Jewish brothers and sisters, when he says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant, Jesus. And he's having this conversation with them because of their response to the event that happened right beforehand. What happened right beforehand? The man walked. Yes, the man was healed, exactly. In a matter of minutes, a man who was lame from birth, who had never been able to walk from the time he left his mother's womb, is jumping up and walking and leaping and praising God. A man who has forever been made to lay outside the temple now enters the temple with Peter and John. A man who's used to receiving band-aid solutions, whatever spare coins people can toss his way as they enter the temple, is healed, body and soul. He receives perfect health, and in Greek, those words mean literally complete or wholeness. I'd like to have perfect health. <laughs> That'd be nice, right? This is the miracle, the very first miracle, that Peter and John perform in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is a resurrection story. When the text says Peter took the lame man by the right hand and raised him up, in the Greek, the word is the same word used when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Remember Justin preaching on that last week? Same word. It's the same word Peter uses later in this same passage to describe how God raised Jesus from the dead. And it's the same word used when Jesus healed the paralytic man. You know, the one who was lowered down through the roof on a mat? Y'all remember that story? Same word used then. A man not unlike the man in this passage, who was lame from birth. You see, Peter and John are carrying on the work of resurrection that began in Jesus Christ. The work that Jesus commissioned and appointed them to do when he said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. In the healing of this crippled beggar, Peter and John are continuing the work of resurrection in the power of Jesus' name. But the crowd doesn't get it. They are filled with wonder and amazement. They're utterly astonished when they see what has happened to this man who they know, who they recognize as the one who used to lay outside the gates of the temple. But they're astonished and amazed for all the wrong reasons. It's clear that they don't get it from the way they look at Peter and John as if by their own power or piety they had made the man walk. It's not their power. It's not the power of Peter and John. The crowd doesn't understand what they're able to do in Jesus' name. 
because they haven't fully grasped the power of Jesus' name. And so, in that moment, Peter decides they need to have a come to Jesus meeting. Y'all ever had to have one of those before? Yeah. Me, with my mama, a lot, when I was being defensive, right? <laughs> he spells it out for them. He makes it plain exactly where and how they have gone and done wrong. He calls them out. He's brutally honest with them. He doesn't beat around the bush. It feels harsh. And yet, at the same time, Peter testifies to exactly who Jesus is. Jesus is God's glorified servant, who they handed over. Jesus is the holy and righteous one who they rejected. Jesus is the author of life who they killed. Yet God raised Jesus from the dead, and it is by this same power that the lame man now leaps. This is the power of Jesus' name. Peter could have ended his speech right then and there, after calling the people out and explaining to them what was really going on. I just didn't get before. He could have moved on and gone about the rest of his day. He could have written them off and washed his hands of them. But he doesn't. No. Peter isn't done yet. Because Peter's M.O. isn't just to call people out. He's not calling them out for the sake of calling them out to embarrass them or shame them. He's calling them out to call them in. He's not trying to cancel them. He's trying to show them a better way by broadening who Jesus is. He says to them, and now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. Peter calls them friends. He cares for these people. He has compassion for them. He humanizes them by naming the fact that they were ignorant before. And maybe he's especially empathetic because y'all remember who Peter is, right? Peter's the guy who told Jesus that he wouldn't deny him and then went and denied him three times when it mattered the most. He knows something about being called out and messing up. But Peter extends the same grace to the people that Jesus extended to him when he told Peter, after Peter had denied him, to feed his sheep. And he said, follow me. Peter offers the people a better way. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped. See, his ultimate desire for the people is so much bigger than simply calling them out. What he really wants is for them to join forces with him and the other disciples. He wants them to join in the work of witnessing to the resurrection power of Jesus' name. He wants them to experience the same kind of resurrected freedom and complete wholeness, perfect health, as the man who was lame but now leaps. Peter is not just calling them out. He's calling them in to resurrection life. But before they can get there, they're going to have to reckon with the past, take an honest look at where they went wrong, and take time to repent. Friends, I know you know, we're living in a time when there's a lot of calling out and canceling going on. Can I get an amen? Amen. And like I said in the beginning, I know how easy it is to get defensive when you feel like you're being called out because I do it all the time. It's easy to put our guards up and put walls up to try to defend ourselves when we feel like we're 
Okay, guys, when we feel like our values and traditions and all that we've ever known are being threatened by the change that's occurring all around. But Peter shows us in this passage that as long as it is, sometimes a call out is necessary. Calling out injustice is always necessary. Jesus did it again and again and again. He named it boldly in the face of the powers that be. But Jesus was never trying to cancel anybody. Jesus was never trying to cancel anybody. He was trying to call them in to a better way of life, a better way of being in the world, a way of compassionate, inclusive, grace-filled love and justice. That's what Jesus was trying to do. Willie James says about this passage, I quoted him earlier, before praises go up to God, the poor and the lame, the sick and the pained must be seen. This lame man lay in the path toward praise, which is also the path of the disciples. This route was established by Jesus. This man is precisely the person Jesus will see and demands his disciples see. Peter and John find themselves without an option to see with the eyes of Jesus. And Peter sees the Israelites with the eyes of Jesus, too. Because he knows that not only does Jesus want to include those who have been left out before, he even wants to include those who denied him before. People like Peter, who stayed silent out of fear when it mattered the most, People like the Israelites who rejected Jesus because of their ignorance. Jesus wants everybody to be part of everything he's doing in the world. I feel real vulnerable up here now, and I'm going to get defensive because I feel like I totally messed up the great sermon. But you know what? I'm just going to. I'm going to be real here with y'all. Um, sometimes what feels like a call out and hurts and makes us get really defensive and want to start coming back at people is really a call in. It's what Peter's doing here in this passage. He calls the Israelites out and it feels really harsh and you're like, oh man, I would not want to be the Israelites in this situation. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop with the call out. He wants to call them in to a whole new life to a new life, to resurrected life. Sometimes what feels like criticism is really an invitation to see things from a different perspective. And so I want us to think this morning, what is it that gets your hackles up? What is it that when you hear something or see something about it on the news or on social media, you start getting ready with your opposition because before we go getting all defensive and putting our guards up, maybe we need to take the time to listen to the whole story and see if we can hear a call in. If the people had stopped listening to Peter after he called them out, they might not have heard his call in to repentance. They might have missed his call in to resurrection life. Church, let's not miss it. Let's not miss the call in to resurrection life. Let's not miss the Easter invitation to leave our tombs behind and be on the loose in the world, flinging the gates wide, 
so that all can enter in. Continuing Jesus' work of justice and healing and restoration for all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen. And now we stand for our hymn of decision. This is uh, Come Sinners to the Gospel Feast. It's a good Wesleyan hymn. It's Charles Wesley. And it is a call in, if you've ever heard one. So I invite you to prayerfully hear and sing these words today before we leave. to be able to listen, to listen to other people, to other perspectives, and to listen for the call in. And I need to do it as much as anybody else, right? So if, if you take anything from this morning, I hope, I hope you take that, and I hope you take the invitation from Jesus, the call in to come, sinners, we're all sinners, to the gospel feast, and be called in to resurrection. Go now with the peace of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.